You are listening to continuing coverage of the trial of Chad Daybell from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Let's go back to the courtroom. And we know where that young lady was found. She was found on Chad Daybell's property. Chad labels someone dark. Chad says if someone's so dark or a zombie, the body has to die. Alex believes Chad 100%. You heard that the burned and charred remains of Tylee Ryan were found on Chad Daybell's property. You heard from Dr. Garth Warren that Tylee's manner of death was homicide with the cause undetermined. Why was the cause undetermined? Well, you heard from Dr. Angie Christensen, and you also heard from Dr. Bartolink how Tylee's body was burned. Dr. Bartolink even indicated, depending on what accelerant was maybe used, Tylee could have been burned within two hours. You heard from Dr. Angie Christensen that there were multi multiple areas of blunt force trauma to the skull, sternum, and ribs. You then heard Dr. Bartolink confirm that. In addition, there were 18 sharp force impacts. Additionally, you heard from Katie Dace how Tylee's DNA was found on a pickaxe and a shovel that were in the defendant's garage. We also heard from Alice and Todd Gilbert. And Alice Gilbert talked about how when Tylee was still missing, before she was found, Alice asked Chad about her. She wanted to know, doesn't Tylee want a life? Doesn't she want things that most young girls get? Chad's response, well, Tylee didn't like people and she didn't like me. What stood out to Alice? Tylee hadn't been found yet. And the comment was in the past tense. Tylee was now gone, but JJ was still alive. We heard from Zulema Pastenis how she visited in September. She stayed at Alex's apartment, but she would visit with Lori. You heard from her that she asked Lori, where's Tylee? Because she didn't see her. Lori's response, don't ask. Zulema talked about how she did see JJ though. JJ was alive and well at that time. On September 18th, of 2019, Lori began receiving the social security payments for JJ and herself from Charles' death. Back in July, again, shortly after Charles' death, Lori's asking Chad, I need you to check JJ. Why? He was calm and wanted to watch movies. Her kid's calm and wants to watch movies, and her first thought, have Chad check him. Chad's response, JJ is at a two. On August 10th of 2019, Chad messaged Lori that JJ was getting close. Says, when I was sitting across from him eating bacon, I sensed he was barely attached to his body. On August 10th, again, Lori had asked, please check JJ. Chad's response, or then Lori further pushes, is he at zero yet? Chad's response, yes, he's at zero. If Chad labels someone darker a zombie, the body has to die. Chad determines the death percentage. When the death percentage hits zero, that person's been marked for death. On September 23rd of 2019, you heard how there was location data associated with Alex Cox looked at. And before that, you'd heard from Melanie Gibb and David Warwick about how they were visiting Lori. They'd come up for an event and they were staying at Lori's house. You heard from them, from Melanie Gibb in particular, that there was an incident where Chad took JJ upstairs. And when Chad came down, he had scratches on his neck, that being Chad had scratches. And when asked what happened, he basically said JJ had freaked out. On September 22nd of 2019, you heard from Melanie Gibb and David Warwick how they saw Alex come in carrying JJ. JJ's head was on Alex's shoulder. They assumed he was asleep. David Warwick thought it was a sweet moment. In the early morning hours of September 23rd, you heard from Melanie Gibb how something had startled David. He'd had a panic attack, a bad dream, something. She called Chad, no answer. She tried to get a hold of Lori, no answer. She tried Lori's door and it was locked. The next morning, you heard from David Warwick that he asked where JJ was. On the morning of September 23rd, he said, I wanted to say goodbye to JJ before I left. They described Lori as appearing somewhat nervous, starting to talk fast, and she explained how JJ was dark. JJ was now a zombie. JJ had gotten on the cabinets. He was knocking over pictures of Christ. And so he wasn't there. And she wasn't going to go get him. Melanie and David never saw JJ again. On September 23rd, later that morning, Alex or Chad places a call to Alex. 
And what does Alex do when Chad calls him? He heads up to Chad's property. And what do we then know? Alex's device is at Chad's property with some data points there showing at 9.56 a.m. and 10.02 a.m. Oh, oh, my goodness. We know where JJ was found. JJ was found on Chad Daybell's property, close to where those red data marks are. On June 9th of 2019, investigators searched Chad's property, and they ended up locating JJ. As they dug JJ up, they noticed a round object covered in black. One of the investigators there cut the black plastic to reveal white plastic. They cut the white plastic, and brown human hair came, came through. They'd finally found JJ. JJ had been buried with his arms duct taped together, the duct tape running around from elbow to elbow. He had duct tape over his mouth. He had a plastic bag over his head, tape over that plastic bag, and then he was placed in black garbage bags and discarded. That's how JJ was found. Chad labeled him dark. Chad said his death percentage was at zero. Chad said the plan was for he and Lori to be together unencumbered by earthly relatives, earthly obstacles. Chad said those things. And Alex believed Chad 100%. Chad knew Lori was receiving Social Security money. She told him, we saw that message. I'm still going to receive the 4000 She was actually receiving more because she'd switched Tylee's money to go to her as well. Chad labeled her children dark. Their bodies were buried on his property, hidden from those looking for them. With them gone, he could be with Lori. Her time was completely free for him. And, he, and knowing if the bodies weren't discovered, Lori would continue to receive that money. She heard from Mark Sari with the Social Security Administration should have been reported. Lori continued to receive those benefits. Had the children been discovered, she wouldn't have. Melanie Pulowski talked about how she visited Lori towards the end of September. And when she visited, neither Tylee or JJ were present. She said she asked Lori about Tylee and she was told that Tylee was at school or with friends. Well, you heard from Wynn Hill. Tylee was never registered, never applied, never associated with BYU-Idaho. But that was Lori's story for Melanie Pulowski. When Melanie asked where JJ was, Lori told her, he has a nanny, she's really helpful. Melanie described that she couldn't really get a clear answer from Lori. But what you also heard from both Melanie Pulowski and Ian Pulowski is Melanie trusted Chad and Lori. She looked to them as parental figures. She turned to them for advice and guidance. And particularly with Chad, she talked about that. She turned to Chad to find out if people were light or dark. We know that around October 2nd of 2019, Tylee Ryan's Jeep travels to Arizona. And you heard from Bra Brandon Boudreaux about what happened. Brandon Boudreaux saw the Jeep, saw a gun, and someone took a shot at him. That someone was Alex Cox. Brandon Boudreaux had been determined to be dark by Chad Daybell. That bullet hit the top of Brandon's car. Brandon lived to report it. He lived to tell what happened. Brandon said that Jeep was missing the tire off the back. He noticed that. And you heard from analyst Heidemann how on October 2nd, Chad and Lori were seen in Rexburg, Idaho, storing a tire. During that trip, we talked about a device being at Lori's apartment, one of Alex's devices on September 30th. It was during that trip. He'd left the device with Lori. And you heard Zulema talk about how Chad and Lori would try to encourage her to move to Rexburg, and particularly Chad. He gave her several blessings where that was part of the blessing. Zulema expressed she didn't know how she was going to make that work. She didn't have ties here. Her job wasn't here. Her kids weren't here. And she expressed to Lori, I don't know how I'd financially do it. Lori said, don't worry. Melanie, referring to Melanie Pulowski, will take care of us. Melanie was still legally married to Brandon when that shot was fired. Melanie had kids with Brandon. Lori knew if dad dies, kids get Social Security. The custodian, the mother get Social Security benefits. Just days later, on October 4th of 2019, Tammy Daybell travels down to Utah. Now, you heard testimony that was rare for Tammy to go on a long trip alone. She didn't like to drive alone. But you also heard Chad was supposed to go with her, and he backed out. Why did he back out? Well, we saw the messages between Lori and Alex about how she and Chad were going to get to go on a real date. Tammy was gone to Utah. 
he and Lori were going to get to go on a date. You heard from her sister, Samantha Gwilliam, how because Tammy had been diagnosed with depression at some point, she made it a habit that when she would see her, she would give her a once over. She would check on her, make sure she looked healthy, make sure she didn't appear to be suffering with the depression. Samantha did that on this trip. And what did she notice? Tammy appeared fine. She noticed no physical problems. Tammy reported no physical problems. She reported no medical issues to Samantha. Samantha saw none. In fact, what did we hear? Tammy put on a clogging routine. She had a nice visit with her family. Both Samantha and Jason William talked to you about some changes they'd noticed before that October 4th visit, and particularly with Chad. Chad and Jason had been very good friends. Conversation flowed easily. But that summer of 2019, they talked about Chad and Tammy coming to visit, and Chad was awkward. He didn't really engage with them. They took note of it, but they didn't know what was, what was going on. Then you heard from Samantha how Tammy was down there around her birthday. Samantha didn't even know Tammy was going to be in Utah. Tammy runs up to the door to give her her birthday present, gets to stay just long enough to watch her open it. Chad never left the car. Chad and Jason were friends, and you heard Samantha say they'd had no falling out, nothing that she could think to explain why Chad wouldn't come into the house. Again, back in July, when Chad and Lori are talking about death percentages, Chad tells Lori... He got the inspiration to go back to his, to my, he uses my, my original death percentages that helped us track Charles, Ned. Chad had the death percentages to track Charles. Tammy is very close. Her percentage has fallen steadily since Iplos left. It is encouraging. Charles Vallow was killed on July 11th of 2019. Since he left... Tammy's levels were dropping. Chad then tells Lori, Tammy is at a three. Chad tells Lori on July 30th of 2019, this afternoon, Tammy said she felt lightheaded as if her body and spirit weren't connected. Interestingly enough, Coroner Dye made a similar note in a report that Chad told her something along the lines of Tammy not feeling connected to her body. Chad said that back in July. On October 5th, Chad messages Lori, Big news about Tammy. The short version is she has been switched. Tammy is in limbo and a level three demonic entity named Viola is in her body. Tammy's now a zombie essentially, or she has a dark entity in her. Again, someone's dark, someone's a zombie. The body has to die. And Chad can tell and controls the death percentages. Chad goes on to tell Lori, I have now checked three times since I got home and get more affirmative answers each time. Chad then tells her, not fully sure of the timing for removal, but once her actions verify the differences, I don't want to wait. Someone's dark, the body has to die. Chad doesn't want to wait. On October 9th of 2019, you all heard about an attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell. Earlier in the day, a device associated with Alex Cox traveled down to Sportsman's Warehouse and you heard how Alex purchased several items. They were all dark in color, a face mask, a knit beanie, frog tog pants, and mittens. And you heard the gloves were a flip mitt. You could pull them back to do things that you needed your fingers for, such as shooting a gun. You heard how later on the 9th, after going to Sportsman's, that device drove up by the Daybell residence, didn't stop, but was in the vicinity and then left back to Rexburg. What you also heard was that Alex Cox had purchased a burner phone on October 8th of 2019, just the day before. That device was activated on October 9th of 2019. Chad Daybell also had a new burner phone that he'd activated on October 8th of 2019. And you heard talk of the 401 number. That particular phone was only in contact with Lori Vallow, and Alex Cox. You heard how around October 9th and in the days after, there were, there were multiple searches conducted on the Homer J. Maximus account. Homer J. Maximus was Alex's account. He had searched drop from 100 yards to 300 yards, 6.5 Grendel. How to prep your AR for the cold, how to load your AR, help load your AR in the cold, how to shoot through a Dodge Dakota how to shoot through a windshield. You heard that the Daybells owned a Dodge Dakota. 
And you heard mixed testimony on who drove the car the most, but what was unrefuted is that at a minimum, Tammy did drive that car at times, at a minimum. On October 9th of 2019, there were multiple messages exchanged between Alex, Chad, Zulema, and Lori. The attempted shooting occurred at around 9.15 p.m., and then four text messages were exchanged between Alex and Chad between 1028 and 1029. Remember, Alex's normal phone or his usual device was left at his apartment, but he had just activated a burner phone. You heard from Zulema that on this same day and around the same time, Lori invited her over to Melanie Pulowski's house in Arizona to conduct a casting on Tammy. And Zulema had told her, we finally have it figured out we really know how to do this. And you heard from the ladies that what they were taught is if a casting was successful, the body would die or it would naturally expire. They weren't taught that anyone was going to take any action on the body. They were just taught that it would naturally happen. Zulema talked about how that night, Lori got a phone call. And she said she had never seen Lori so mad. And when Lori got off the phone, she made a comment along the lines of, that idiot can't do anything right or can't do anything by himself. And when we talk about the timeline on October 9th, you can see there were multiple communications between Chad and Lori and Alex and Chad. The other thing that you notice on here is this incident is reported at 941, originally by Joe Murray. And you heard from Joe Murray, he's Tammy's son-in-law. You see that the Fremont County Sheriff's Office was dispatched at 945 p.m. And then at 949, Tammy made a call into the non-emergency line in Fremont County. 9.52 is when the Fremont County deputy arrives on scene. And why does that matter? Tammy had done a search, or someone using Tammy's account had done a search for first, an airsoft gun, and second, a paintball gun. But when you look at the time of the search, 3.29, if you do the calculations for UTC, it ends up at either close to 8.30 p.m. or close to 9.30 p.m. Attempted shooting happens around 9.15. So around 9.30, Tammy is conducting those searches. Well, why does that matter? Deputy Cannon's not on scene. Deputy Cannon doesn't get to the scene until 9.52. He can't be there when Tammy's looking at anything. He can't be there to know who did the Google searches. And Deputy Cannon talked to you about the fact that he was looking for casings. Why was he looking for casings? Because he didn't know. He thought it could be a rifle. Nobody knew if this was a paintball gun or a rifle. What else we know from Deputy Cannon's report is towards the bottom, when he talked to Joe Murray, Joe Murray told him he was cutting wood on his property when he heard Tamara scream. Joe Murray heard his mother-in-law scream. He called 911. Later, Tammy called dispatch. We know Tammy sent an email to her son, Mark, and we reviewed that email several times. We know Tammy called into dispatch and we reviewed that call several times. Tammy at times refers to it as a paintball gun, but remember how she describes it. He was holding it like it was a rifle. He was pointing it at me. He was pulling the trigger. He was shooting at me. This wasn't someone just pointing a gun. This wasn't a prank. The person was pulling the trigger. She says it was dark. She describes the person dressed all in black and she describes the person wearing a face mask. Remember, Alex Cox had purchased a face mask earlier that day at Sportsman's Warehouse. Alex Cox had purchased black or dark clothing earlier that day at Sportsman's Warehouse. Alex Cox had a 6.5 Grendel. Alex Cox was searching about shooting a 6.5 Grendel in the dark or in the cold. Why? You heard from Detective Kaikamanu that it was 26 degrees on October 9th of 2019. You heard in Tammy's own words, he stood there pulling the trigger, shooting. The gun didn't go off or the gun misfired. Alex is searching about how to shoot an AR in the cold. You heard from both Investigator Edwards and Detective Kaikamanu about their training with paintball guns and their training with ARs. You heard from them how the scope on an AR could be mistaken for a hopper on a paintball gun. You further heard when it's dark, it's even harder to tell. You further heard that if the gun is pointed at you, it's gonna be that much harder to tell. You also heard that Tammy wasn't familiar with guns. Her own kids, Emma and Garth, told you. They've never seen Tammy with a paintball gun. They've never seen Tammy with an assault rifle. But what do you know? 
Tammy was scared. Tammy sent a Facebook message warning people. In her email to Mark, Tammy said, the scared part came later when I realized what could have happened. I didn't want to go out the next night alone after dark. Tammy had no idea someone wanted her dead, but she was still scared by that incident. And we talked about how Alex had done some additional searches, or that account had, about how to shoot with the AR. And you heard how Alex was going to the shooting range in Fremont County from Detective Kaikamanu, and that was before and after this attempted shooting of Tammy. And you heard from Agent Wright how he was going to the shooting range in Rexburg, and he was practicing to shoot long distances. And you heard from Investigator Edwards, he talked to you about how he looked at that gun. He looked at that Grendel 6.5, and it had a pin that was loose. And he explained to you about how if that pin had come loose, that could cause the gun to misfire. Alex didn't know why the gun misfired. That's why he was looking at shooting an AR in the cold. Instead, we do not know of any other attempted shootings of Tammy Daybell. Instead, what we know is that on October 19th of 2019, just before 6 a.m., Chad Daybell and Garth Daybell made a call to 911 to report Tammy's death. Remember how Garth described her. She's stiff and cold. Remember what Chad said. She's clearly dead. A little over 24 hours from reporting his wife's death, Chad messages Lori. I know exactly how you feel. I'm feeling sad, but it isn't for the reason everyone thinks. His wife had been reported dead a little over 24 hours before he sent that to Lori. You heard the description of Tammy. Stiff and cold, clearly dead. And yet, Garth and Chad say they put her back on the bed. Garth says he hears a thud and his dad calls for him. However, Garth and Chad were consistent. Tammy didn't fall out of bed. Where's the thud? They both describe the top part of Tammy falling out of the bed and her legs being tangled in the sheets. And you heard from the coroner that when she arrived on scene, there was this rag in the bedroom. And she took the rag and she wiped the, the foam or the sputum that was coming out of Tammy's mouth. But what you also heard from her was it was a rag Chad had already been using. Tammy's clearly dead. The body's been moved. The foam's been wiped. And if we back up to October 18th of 2019, we know Lori was in Hawaii. She was in Hawaii with Melanie Pulowski. You heard how Alex took her down to Las Vegas to drop Lori off at the airport shortly before that. But what's more telling than who was in Hawaii is who wasn't. Melanie Pulowski told you Alex Cox was supposed to go with them on that trip. Alex didn't go because Chad needed help with something. Tammy was possessed. Her death percentage was low. Alex believed Chad 100%. And you heard from several witnesses, Detective Kaikamanu, Investigator Edwards, and Agent Balance, that advice associated with Alex Cox was at a church just 2.6 miles from the Daybell residence from 10.07 p.m. to 10.45 p.m. on October 18th of 2019. Chad needed Alex's help with something. You heard testimony. Alex didn't know anyone else in the area. He knew Chad. Alex didn't know Tammy, but he knew Chad. At 11.53 p.m., about a seven, the phone, again, there was a data point, about a seven-minute drive from the church. Garth would have gotten home between 1 and 1.30 from his employment. You heard Garth tell you that when he got home, he saw two lumps in his parents' bed, assumed it was them. He didn't go check on them. He didn't verify anything to see if they were okay. However, you heard from Micaiah Baglin that what Garth told him, that was when Garth got home from work, he found his mom dead in her bed and his dad was nowhere to be found. And you heard from Deputy Greenalch and you heard from Deputy Coroner Wilmore and Coroner Brenda Dye. And you heard them talk about what Chad told them when they were on scene. And the statements changed over time. The statements changed as new people came in. Coroner Dye mentioned something about seizures. All of a sudden, oh yeah, Tammy was having seizure-like activity. Nothing in Tammy's medical records support low blood pressure. Nothing in her medical records support seizures. Nothing in her medical records support any kind of a negative drug interaction between homeopathic medications or any other medications Tammy was on. 
Those were statements provided by Chad Daybell. Initially, based on the information provided solely by Chad, no autopsy was ordered. However, just weeks later, the Fremont County Sheriff's Office was contacted by the Gilbert Police Department about that attempted shooting of Brandon Boudreaux. They'd linked the, the Jeep that was used in that to the Fremont County area. And more specifically, they wanted them to check if it was at Chad Daybell's, on Chad Daybell's property. Shortly after that, an investigation was launched by Fremont County into Tammy Daybell's death. This included exhuming her body. Her body was exhumed so the Utah Medical Examiner's Office could perform a full autopsy and conduct an investigation into the cause and manner of death. And they, in fact, did that. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. After Tammy's death, you heard how Chad told multiple people that he couldn't stay at the house anymore. He was going to move in with a friend. This was right after Tammy's passing. You also heard how Tammy died on October 19th of 2019, or that's when she was pronounced dead. That was a Saturday. Funeral was held in Springville, Utah on Tuesday. One working day to get everything ready. You heard Todd Gilbert say how it felt like Chad just wanted to get it over with. And you also heard from Samantha Gwilliam that she had concerns because Chad indicated he didn't want his name on the headstone. Tammy was going to be buried alone in Springville, Utah. You also heard Patty later talk about she went to the funeral and Chad's talk was disturbing to her. It was disturbing to her because he talked about Tammy's depression and how she was hard to live with. Patty thought that was a little off-putting. Alice Gilbert also thought it was odd, but she thought it was odd that Chad spoke. In her experience, usually it's too difficult for a spouse to give a talk at the funeral. Steve Schultz, who was the mortician from Utah, indicated he thought the timing of the funeral and the fact that there was no autopsy and that Chad didn't want an autopsy was a red flag. So much so that he said, he asked Jason William, Chad's brother-in-law, do you think he killed Tammy? When we talk about the timeline of October 18th to the 19th, you can see the communication. Text between Chad and Lori, Lori and Alex, Chad and Alex, Alex and Lori, and it goes on. They're in constant communication that day between the 18th and the 19th over that time span. Tammy Daybell had an autopsy conducted by the Office of the Utah Medical Examiners. They determined the manner of death to be homicide and the cause to be asphyxiation. Tammy had life insurance. And we talked about a couple different policies. One was Primerica. It was a policy that had been in existence since 2002. Both Chad and Tammy were insured and they were both each other's beneficiaries. However, Tammy also had insurance through her employment, through the Ballard Insurance, or we also called it Life Map. She had a base of 50,000. And on September 8th, just a little over a month before her passing, she raised her individual amount to the maximum of 80,000. So that policy was now a total of 130,000. Chad submitted claim forms to Primerica and to Life Map. On both claim forms, he indicated the cause of death was that she died in her sleep. Chad then received and deposited $300,000 from Primerica on October 31st of 2019 and then deposited $130,000 from LifeMap on November 8th of 2019. Again, on both claimant statements, he put the cause of death was she died in her sleep and maybe more telling on LifeMap because Chad told people that Tammy was having medical issues. She was ha having trouble breathing. She was having shaking fits, dizzy spells. He provided information to try to explain her death. However, on the life map claim form, under the question, when did the health of the deceased first become impaired? He wrote October 18th of 2019. When Tammy upped that life map insurance, Chad signed off on it too. Chad knew she had increased that life insurance. You heard how just days after Tammy's death, Chad went and visited with Alice and Todd Gilbert, and he told them about Lori. And shortly after, he brought Lori to meet with them. And Lori and Chad talked about their plans for a future, their plans to be together. What else was telling about that visit? They asked about kids. Chad's response to Alice, Lori had a daughter, that died. Tylee hadn't been found yet. They went to dinner with Chad's parents, and you heard from Sheila Daybell. Lori told her, I have a daughter that died. We know on May 6th and 7th, 
Chad and Lori Googled searches for malachite rings. This was during a time that Tammy and Charles were still alive. We know on August 14th, Lori attempted to purchase a malachite ring. Again, on August 25th of 2019, she again attempted to purchase a ring. Charles was dead. Tammy was alive. On October 2nd, Lori purchased two malachite rings. Then she also purchased one more. The other ring was a men's size 11 and a half. And what's telling is that ring was returned on October 4th for a size 11. Then on October 25th, it was returned for a size 10 and that ring wasn't returned. That ring, however, resembled the ring Chad Daybell was wearing in their wedding photos when he and Lori got married on October on November 5th of 2019, just 17 days after Tammy's death. Chad filled out a rental application for Hawaii. What did he put in there? Clean couple with no pets or children. No pets, no children. Chad and Lori had been messaging in July about a movie. Lori ended up telling him, looks like Kauai a lot. Chad, hopefully we will be there someday soon together. Chad's response again, that is the plan. That is the plan. What is the plan? To be to Hawaii, to be in Hawaii together, to be in Hawaii unencumbered by earthly obstacles unencumbered by earthly relatives. Chad and Lori got married on the beach in Kauai on November 5th of 2019. Charles was dead. Tammy was dead. Tylee and JJ hadn't been found. No children, no earthly obstacles, married together on the beach. <clears throat> Chad and Lori's bliss didn't last long because Kay Woodcock reported her grandson JJ is missing. And you heard from Detective Hermosillo how in November of 2019, he, along with some other officers, responded to 765 Pioneer Road. You heard how immediately upon arrival, untruths were told. Alex said JJ was with Kay. He said he didn't have a phone number for Lori. Chad said he barely knew Lori and didn't have her phone number. Lori said JJ was with Melanie Gibb and that Chad was her brother's friend. Chad and Lori were married. Hi, Lori, sorry to bother you again. Yeah, we're having, uh, we're having Melanie. get hold of your friend down there, um, Melanie. No. Well, they were going to Frozen 2 today. There's more to come in the trial of Chad Daybell. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of our continuing coverage right here from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast.